Okay. Well, welcome to Grand Rounds. <clears throat> Make sure you get a seat here. Uh, um, prior to the introduction of our speaker, I again like to acknowledge that we're on the um, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, the Squamish, Swelltooth, and uh, Musqueam, and we're grateful for their stewardship and lands. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Barber today, who I've known for a long time. Dr. Barber a, a, did his training at UBC, uh, his post uh, UBC training in Toronto, um, emphasizing glomerulonephritis, and is, and is a chair of the glomerulonephritis uh, uh, working committee, uh, as well as, uh, of, I guess, the administrative component of uh, glomerulonephritis for the province. Uh, it's, it's his research interests as well as his clinical and administrative interests, and uh, he's received uh, grants uh, for his research, including a Michael Smith. <clears throat> so, so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Barber, uh, and he's going to speak today about um, IgA nephropathy uh, and what might be new in IgA nephropathy. Sean, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, the introduction. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about IG nephropathy, and hopefully at the end of this talk, I can convince you that we actually have a lot of new and exciting therapies coming up in um, nephrology um, that are really starting to get at a precision-based uh, approach to treating different different glomerular diseases. Um, so, uh, sorry, here we go. So these are my uh, disclosures. Um, and by way of outline, we, we will start with a brief introduction of IG nephropathy, but it will be pretty brief. And then we'll get into the concept of surrogate markers for outcomes in IG nephropathy, including proteinuria. And then we'll talk about how we've used those surrogate markers to develop new clinical trial paradigms in IG nephropathy, including uh, recent evidence, new evidence for traditional therapies um, like steroids, MMF, and hydroxychloroquine and then uh, more novel immunosuppressive agents that are being studied. And then we finally will finish off with new supportive treatments uh, for IG nephropathy. So first, what is IG nephropathy? Well, um, the immune system uh, produces uh, abnormal galactose deficient IG1 uh, uh, immune globulins in IG nephropathy. These then deposit in the kidney and results in inflammation in the glomeruli, which can progress to scarring over time. So for those of you that aren't overly familiar, which might be many of you, the, the uh, glomerulus, is, a normal glomerulus is shown here. So you can see Bowen's space here is nice and open. There are no cells in it. The capillary loops are nice and open. And the mesangial space is sort of delicate without that many cells. In uh, This is a biopsy of someone with uh, IG nephropathy. So you can see there are far more cells, especially here in, in the mesangial region, which is quite common to see, to, see, to see this. And when you have too many cells, in a particular area in the kidney, we call it um, hypercellularity. So this is mesangial hypercellularity. And in this patient would have quite significant IgA deposits in that mesangial region uh, on an immunofluorescence uh, test. So how does someone develop Ig nephropathy? Well, this currently uh, will be considered to be the multi-hit hypothesis for the development of Ig nephropathy. Hit one seems to start with dysregulation of the enteric immune system. So your enteric immune system is really what is uh, normally responsible for producing galactose deficient IG1 molecules, which are normally secreted into your gut to prevent you from getting infections from uh, enteric organisms. The, the prevailing theory is that um, there's dysregulation of this particular immune system and possibly mistrafficking of immune cells away from the gut into the bone marrow so that they then, instead of producing galactose deficient Ig molecules into the gut, they get produced into the systemic circulation where they are not normally supposed to be. So that's considered hit one. Um, however, that's not sufficient to develop the clinical syndrome of Ig nephropathy. You need at least three other hits. So hit two is the actual production of anti-glycan antibodies. So you have these a secondary phenomenon where you produce antibodies targeting the galactose deficient um, uh, Ig molecules, which then results in hit three which is the formation of immune complexes, which are those antibodies that bound to their antigens, which deposit in the kidney. But again, that also is not sufficient to develop Ig nephropathy because we do know that some people can just have Ig deposits in their kidneys that don't really do anything. So what you need is the final hit, which is that those immune complexes need to induce renal injury. So how do those immune complexes induce renal injury? Well, uh, it, uh, this is one of the theories in terms of how this occurs, 
in terms of the Ig containing immune complex is deposited in the mesangium, resulting in the release of pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic mediators. Those pro-inflammatory mediators produce the sum total of the histologic lesions that we're used to considering in Ig nephropathy, including um, hypercellularity in the mesangial region or inflammatory cell recruitment into the um, uh, capillary loops, which we call endocapillary hypercellularity, or an inflammatory response in Bowman space, which we call crescents. Um, there also uh, is thought to be uh, the direct um, uh, um, interaction between these mediators and perhaps podocytes producing glomerulosclerosis and, and the tubular cells producing tubular interstitial fibrosis. Interestingly, as someone develops more and more proteinuria, some of those um, galactose-deficient Ig molecules can get directly into the urine and then bind directly to podocytes and tubular cells, again producing uh, glomerulosclerosis and tubular interstitial fibrosis. One of the biggest ways in which these immune complexes probably activate the immune system is through activation of the complement system, uh, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end of the talk. So how does IG nephropathy present? Well, it can be extremely variable. Um, a very common presentation is just asymptomatic hematuria or asymptomatic proteinuria that's just picked up on routine dipstick uh, screening, perhaps through a family doctor. Another common presentation would be slowly progressive proteinuric kidney disease. Um, there are more rare but more fulminant presentations, which might include uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis with a crescentic variant or more severe nephrotic syndrome. But these are, these are very, very uncommon in Ig nephropathy. What is unique to Ig nephropathy is the concept of synpharyngitic hematuria, which is that patients will get an upper respiratory tract infection and then within a few days have gross hematuria as a result of activation of the IgA uh, uh, nephropathy. This usually self-resolves on its own, but it's sort of a clinical hint of this, enteric, uh, this, this inherent relationship between the immune system along the aerodigestive tract and disease activity in Ig nephropathy. So how, how do we diagnose Ig nephropathy? It requires a kidney biopsy. There's really no other way to diagnose Ig nephropathy at the current time. There are several advantages of a biopsy. Not only does it give you a diagnosis, but it also provides key information on prognosis in terms of what's the risk of kidney function declining uh, over time. And we now have a standardized way of grading the histology on a biopsy, uh, which is called the MEST-C scoring system. And MEST-C stands for mesangial hypocellularity, endocapillary hypocellularity, segmental sclerosis, tubulo interstitial fibrosis, and crescents. Um, we're going to kind of come back to that a few different times throughout the talk, but it's basically a way of standardizing what you actually see on a biopsy because each one of those lesions has important associations with long-term kidney outcome in Ig nephropathy. So the epidemiology of Ig nephropathy is, is very diverse across the world. So if you look at the proportion of biopsies that have Ig nephropathy, it's significantly more common in Asia and Southeast Asia than it is in Europe or North America. Although more recently, we've seen an increase in the proportion of biopsies showing Ig nephropathy, which is likely a reflection of immigration patterns of individuals coming from, from Asian countries that are then increasing the incidence uh, of the disease. Um, now, why is this the case? Well, there are, there are genetic risk factors um, that uh, contribute to the development of Ig nephropathy. Um, the genetic risk probably accounts for um, at most, you know, seven or 10% of, of, um, of, of the risk of developing disease, but those genetic polymorphisms follow the same geographic distribution around the world as the incidence of disease. So it probably is, you know, driving some of this difference uh, in incidence that we see uh, around the world. In British Columbia, we have the uh, Provincial GN Registry, which captures all uh, cases of uh, biopsy-proven cases of GN in, in the province. And if you look at the incidence of, of disease, which just to remind you is the number of new patients diagnosed each year, it's somewhere around 20 per million. So that means in BC, you know, we have roughly 100 new people per year diagnosed with Ig nephropathy, which if you extrapolate out to the country, means there's roughly 800 people, you know, every year. So these are, these are rare diseases, but they are not that rare that you are never going to see them. Uh, if you look at the prevalence of disease, which just to remind you is the number of people alive at any one time um, uh, with the disease, um, the prevalence is around 200 to 250 per million. Um, again, meaning that in BC, we probably have about a thousand people with Ig nephropathy at any one time, whereas in, in, um, in, across the country, it's more like nine or 10,000. But Ig nephropathy is by far the most prevalent of the underlying glomerular diseases. 
mostly because it involves uh, diagnosis at, at, at a younger age uh, and patients live much longer uh, uh, with the disease as opposed to things like ankyovasculitis or lupus nephritis, which might have you know, higher mortality rates inherently in, uh, related to the underlying disease process. So how do we predict uh, disease progression in, in IG nephropathy? Um, well, there are several risk factors we can consider, um, uh, including the MESC histology um, uh, scores, which I mentioned, including demographics like age, sex, or ethnicity, or things like baseline kidney function or proteinuria or blood pressure. And, and this is one of the big challenges in IG nephropathy is, is if you have a patient in front of you, how do you decide which of these patients are at um, a higher risk of progression to kidney failure and therefore you should target with more aggressive immunosuppressive agents? And we've done a lot of work with the um, International IG Nephropathy Research Group to actually derive and then subsequently validate uh, prediction tools that can be used to combine these different risk factors together. So we've um, uh, there's now this, this prediction tool called the International IG Nephropathy Prediction Tool, which is actually recommended in the 2021 Key Eagle Guidelines as, as the method, the preferable method to actually risk stratify patients with IG nephropathy. So um, with that in mind, as a sort of basic background of, of IG nephropathy, um, let's, let's talk about proteinuria as a surrogate marker uh, for, for uh, kidney function decline um, uh, in, in IG nephropathy. And so um, the, uh, this was evaluated best by something called the Kidney Health Initiative, which was a collaboration between the American Society of Nephrology and the um, FDA in the United States. They actually did an individual level patient analysis of 830 patients that came from 11 different randomized trials that looked at various different kinds of interventions, whether it was corticosteroids or immunosuppression or RAS blockade and ACE inhibitors. And the fundamental goal here was to determine if a treatment's short-term impact on proteinuria was a valid surrogate marker for the long-term impact you could expect on a, on a hard kidney outcome like doubling serum creatinine or NSAGE kidney disease. And they picked a reduction in proteinuria of around nine months. And they did several different types of analyses. They did patient level analyses and trial level analyses. So at the patient level, certainly a reduction in proteinuria was correlated with a reduction in the risk of, of the hard kidney outcome. They also looked at what's called the proportion of treatment effect. So what's the proportion of the effect that treatment has on the hard endpoint that can actually be explained by short-term reductions in proteinuria? This was pretty variable, uh, but in the corticosteroid treatment uh, um, part of the, the study, it was around 30%, meaning 30% of the heart outcome could be explained by short-term changes in proteinuria. But probably the, the best analysis was done at the trial level because this better accounts for confounding between the groups. And, and, and that's the result that's shown here. And on the x-axis, we have the treatment effect on proteinuria. And on the y-axis, we have the treatment effect on on the hard clinical endpoint. And so, for example, the treatment effect on proteinuria 0.85 means that proteinuria was 15% lower in, um, in the treatment group compared to the control group. And that was highly correlated with a reduction in the risk of a long-term doubling of serum creatinine or end-stage kidney disease. So the, the main conclusion here is that there's now strong epidemiologic and clinical trial data that does support short-term changes in proteinuria as a reasonably likely surrogate marker for harder endpoints in IG nephropathy. There's a couple of caveats though, that there's really no definition of complete proteinuria remission that we can use. Instead, we need to sort of compare uh, it on a continuous scale, like the percent reduction in proteinuria in one treatment group compared to another. The other major limitation was at the time of this analysis, it wasn't known if there was a minimum duration of proteinuria remission that was required before you actually have a beneficial effect on long-term kidney outcome. Like how long do you need to be in remission for before you might be reasonably certain that, that the long-term kidney trajectory will be positively uh, impacted. So to address that question, um, our research group, again, uh, in collaboration with our international colleagues, um, pooled our data sets together and basically identified all patients who went into remission. And the goal here was to determine if the duration of remission was associated with a 50% decline uh, in EGFR or end-stage kidney disease. And th these are the main results here. So on the x-axis, we have the, the duration of proteinuria remission. And on the y-axis, we have the reduction in the risk of a 50% decline in GFR or ESKD. And the main point here is that there was actually no minimum period of proteinuria remission that was actually identified. There was a very strong dose response relationship, meaning every additional three months, a patient spent in remission was associated with a 9% relative risk reduction in the hard clinical endpoint. And this sort of sequentially added up with progressively longer periods in remission up to around three or four years. 
After that point, you seem to reach relatively maximum benefit and the additional uh, uh, protective benefit tended to plateau, plateau off. But that's a long period you know, in proteinuria remission. But what it does mean is that each three months a patient spends in remission is actually protective for their long-term kidney health. We also looked at whether this relationship was different within any kind of relevant subgroup. So it didn't really seem to matter the time from biopsy diagnosis to when someone went into remission or what the peak proteinuria was prior to remission, or for that matter, whether that remission was induced by immunosuppressive medications or just RAS blockade or um, uh, the underlying histology score. In, in all these scenarios, the fundamental underlying relationship remained quite similar. So collectively now we have um, some strong data to suggest that um, from the KHI analysis, the amount of proteinuria reduction in the short term at around nine months is a good valid surrogate marker for outcome. And then the duration of proteinuria remission is also important from our recent analysis, which supports proteinuria as a surrogate outcome in clinical trials. So after all of that, why is that important? The reason that that's important is we have we now have an entirely new framework for, for clinical trial development and subsequently drug approval uh, in IG nephropathy. So, so uh, the, a new framework is that um, a clinical trial can randomize, uh, for example, a patient to active drug or placebo, and then get a readout of the trial results after nine months and look at the primary, um, uh, the reduction in proteinuria at nine months. And based on the KHI analysis, the FDA, including as well as the European Medical Association, will now provide expedited drug approval for use uh, if there's a, a significant reduction in proteinuria at nine months, as uh, shown by the active treatment group. However, that is contingent upon there being sufficient patients and sufficient follow-up to confirm a correlation with the GFR-based outcome after two years of follow-up, which is usually the rate of change of GFR over, over two years. So I would, I would argue that this framework here and the KHI analysis is probably um, uh, what is responsible for the substantial increase in clinical trial interest we now have in IG nephropathy um, uh, and, and basically is, is, is the explanation for why we have so many new and interesting therapies being studied. Now, this is as compared to our traditional trial design in, in, in nephrology, which was follow patients over time and look for, for example, a 50% reduction in GFR or end-stage kidney disease and compare that risk between the two treatment groups. This, this framework has several advantages uh, over our traditional approach. First is that it's shorter term so that you can get um, an outcome readout at nine months and a definitive outcome at two years. The second is that we're using continuous outcomes. So every patient has an outcome, meaning the outcomes are more frequent. The sum total of this makes the fact that the trial is much smaller and shorter term to do and therefore substantially cheaper and more feasible. So this is, this is a really, really big deal in terms of the development of drugs in, in IG nephropathy uh, uh, over the last few years. So with all that in mind, let's consider some new evidence for corticosteroids in the treatment of IG nephropathy. So where do corticosteroids work in our multi-hit hypothesis? They probably work down here in terms of just generally dampening the immune system response to immune complex uh, de deposits uh, in the kidney. But if you look at the 2021 KDGO guidelines, they essentially suggest that all most patients um, should start off with optimal supportive care. So blood pressure control, salt restriction, uh, RAS blockade, yeah. assess cardiovascular risk, smoking cessation, think weight loss, exercise, things like that. So with that, you will definitely see a reduction in proteinuria in the majority of patients with IG nephropathy. But those patients whose proteinuria remains above one gram per day, who has some degree of preserved GFR above 30, could then be considered for corticosteroids according to the 2021 guidelines. The challenge though is that the doses of corticosteroids recommended in the guidelines were relatively high and these were based on older studies, all of which were equivalent to around one milligram per kilogram per day so um, uh, over a total of around two months and then tapered off over six months. And this is quite a substantial dose of corticosteroids which was associated with a lot and a lot of side effects. So uh, with that in mind, I'll present some of the results of the, uh, the testing trial, which was uh, published if, um, uh, last year, which actually now has some data for reduced dose uh, corticosteroids in IG nephropathy. So the testing trial design is shown here, basically a randomized patients with biopsy proven IG nephropathy at any time point, proteinuria above one gram per day and GFR over 20, who are already on maximum RAS blockade. And they randomized patients to either methylprednisolone or placebo. Now, this trial was conceived prior to the PHI framework, so it still uses a hard kidney outcome of a 40% decline in GFR 
kidney failure or death due to kidney disease. Now, the trial started uh, roughly 2012, 2013, but in 2015, the Data Safety Monitoring Board looked at adverse events, and they discovered a substantial imbalance in serious adverse events between the methylprednisolone group and, and the treatment group. And the original dose of methylprednisolone was, again, equivalent to about prednisone one milligram per kilogram per day. So as a result of this interim analysis, there was actually a decision to change the dose and reduce it to the equivalent of around 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, up to a maximum of 40 milligrams. So the, the reason for that is that there was a suggestion in the literature that maybe this would be equally effective, but presumably have less toxicity than the higher dose of prednisone. So based on that analysis, the protocol was then changed. Patients continued to be enrolled in the trial, but now being randomized to the lower dose or the reduced dose um, of, of, of prednisone. So these are the patient characteristics. So roughly there's about 500 patients as you can see, this is typical for patients with IG nephropathy, right? So they're diagnosed pretty young in their mid-30s. They have GFR roughly around 60, proteinuria of around 2 grams per day. This trial just happened to be done predominantly in Asia. So 75% of patients were of Chinese um, uh, ancestry, uh, whereas the remaining were generally distributed between South Asian and Southeast Asian, with very few white patients in the trial. So white patients were sort of underrepresented uh, in this trial. Patients were enrolled pretty quickly. Uh, within about five months of their, their biopsies, and uh, most patients had some form of activity on their biopsy. So this is the primary outcome here, showing uh, for the risk of a 40% decline in GFR, ESKD, or kidney death. So, so prednisone, uh, or, or methylprednisolone, I should say, overall, uh, significantly reduced that risk by about 50%. So that's a huge hazard ratio and a very, very large, and quite frankly, impressive uh, uh, treatment effect. But as I showed you, um, the trial actually had two different protocols, right? One was the reduced dose protocol and one was the full dose protocol. Now, uh, the reduced dose protocol by design had less follow-up. So that's why the x-axis here has a different time scale. But basically, there was no interaction effect between these two, meaning both of these treatments appear to be equally effective for reducing the risk of the primary outcome, which was good news because it means that you could get away with less prednisone, but have equal efficacy in terms of reducing the risk of kidney uh, function decline. They did several different subgroup analyses within um, uh, baseline levels of proteinuria or kidney function, which didn't really show any difference. Now, I did mention that um, most 75% of patients were of Chinese ancestry and they did an interaction effect with ethnicity and showed that um, really, actually, if anything, there was a trend towards perhaps slightly better efficacy in patients of non-Chinese uh, ancestry, which is, I think, important given the ethnic sort of distribution within this that within this cohort. This figure shows the GFR trajectory over time. So in the orange group, you have the methylprednisolone group, and in the gray group, you have placebo, and you can see GFR trajectory was substantially better in the prednisone group. And, and just to point out, the rate of kidney function decline was quite fast at around 5 mLs per minute per year in the placebo group. And there was a substantial slowing of that rate uh, in, in the steroid group. So coming back to our uh, original discussion around proteinuria, so, so, so this is the figure that shows proteinuria trajectory over time. You can see that proteinuria in the methylprednisolone group decreased very early, uh, out to six months here. So that, that finding is consistent with the KHI analysis that suggests those short-term changes in proteinuria are really associated with long-term uh, benefit on kidney function. And what you can see is that over the first sort of three years of the study, proteinuria was substantially lower in the treatment group. However, what you might also notice is that after three years, proteinuria tended to be quite similar between the two groups, meaning there was a slow uptick in proteinuria uh, uh, in the treatment group. Now, why might this occur? This could occur because you had a relapse in active IG nephropathy, or conversely, it could occur because there was an underlying degree of scarring that occurred, and that that scarring contributed to slowly increasing proteinuria over time. Unfortunately, we have a no way of actual differentiating that other than repeating a kidney biopsy. It would be ideal if we had a biomarker that might be able to differentiate those two things non-invasively, because obviously the treatment approach would be very, very different between active disease versus scarring. So what about serious adverse events? So here's where the problem lies. So initially, the serious adverse events were seen in around 11% of the steroid group versus 3% of the placebo group. This was dominated, however, by serious adverse events in the full dose uh, cohort. The reduced dose cohort had relatively similar adverse events compared to placebo. Um, the the uh, cause or the, 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 the driving cause of serious adverse events were infections causing hospitalization, which is probably what you would expect uh, in, in a 
trial looking at something uh, like with a huge amount of toxicity like corticosteroids. Um, they also reported all-cause mortality in a total of nine patients, including six in the steroid group. Now, they didn't actually report that separately based on the different um, uh, study doses because there really were not enough events. But it was a bit concerning because we're not used to seeing mortality events in a clinical trial in patients in their mid-30s with IG nephropathy, uh, which probably to some degree reflects some of the toxicity associated with steroids and the infections resulting in hospitalizations, but also to point out three patients in the placebo group um, died as well. So, so this is a study that was being conducted predominantly in Asia and Southeast Asia, and so I think it reflects to some degree some of the background mortality rate in the population in which the study was being performed. Now, um, for the nephrologists out there, they might be wondering, well, there's the STOP IGA trial, uh, which also looked at steroids, but actually did not show an impact on kidney function, whereas the testing trial showed a significant and very prominent reduction in the risk of kidney function decline. And why might that be? Well, if you compare the characteristics of the cohorts in the, in the control groups of both of these studies, you can see some very prominent differences. So the, the age distribution in the STOP cohort was roughly 10 years older than the testing cohort. Despite being 10 years older, they actually had similar GFR and much lower levels of proteinuria. The ethnic distribution was very different um, between these two cohorts, and there was way less activity on kidney biopsy. So if we go back to that international prediction tool I was talking about, if you actually use these baseline characteristics to predict uh, the five-year risk of uh, kidney function decline, you'll actually get a 15% risk in the STOP cohort, but a 38% risk in the testing cohort, meaning the testing cohort was a substantially higher risk cohort than the STOP cohort. And in parallel with that, the rate of kidney function decline was substantially quicker. So it was five versus 1.5 mLs per minute per year. So what this highlights is the fact that you really do need to be very careful about um, the characteristics of patients getting into a trial because the testing trial was always going to be better powered to show an impact on GFR-based outcome events. Um, and it also highlights some of the difficulties of doing a trial where you're using that traditional outcome of a hard threshold reduction in GFR. So in summary, oral corticosteroids can decrease the risk of kidney function decline uh, by around 50%. Full dose uh, steroids have a substantial number of, of side effects. Uh, reduced dose uh, corticosteroids, however, seem to be equally effective, but with far fewer side effects. However, any of us that's actually used prednisone at 0.5 milligrams per kilo probably would recognize that we really do have a need for ongoing less toxic therapies. Now, this cohort was predominantly Chinese, South Asian, and Southeast Asian, which on one hand exactly mirrors the epidemiology of what we know about the disease. However, there was a relative underrepresentation of white patients, but there did not seem to be any kind of interaction um, uh, with, with ethnicity. So what about hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of IG nephropathy? Um, hydroxychloroquine probably works back here at toll-like receptors, which are involved in activation of the enteric immune system. And so there's a theory that hydroxychloroquine may actually reduce activation of the enteric immune system that's involved in hit one of, of the, um, the pathogenesis of IG nephropathy. So this is a single center uh, trial that was um, uh, published a few years ago, looking at hydroxychloroquine uh, as a treatment for IG nephropathy. It was quite small cohort of 60 patients from a single center in Beijing uh, with proteinuria, um, uh, preserved GFR above 30 on maximum RAS blockade. They were randomized to six months of placebo or six months of hydroxychloroquine, and the primary outcome here was change in proteinuria. If you look at the, the trial characteristics, it's overall very similar to what we saw in testing. So patients in their mid-30s, GFR in the mid-50s, proteinuria 1.7 grams per day, and quite a bit of activity um, and inflammation noted on the kidney biopsy. So this is the primary study results. So, so at six months, there was a 48% reduction in proteinuria in the plaquenil group versus actually a 10% increase in the placebo group. So that proteinuria reduced down to less than one gram per day in the plaquenil group and increased in the placebo group. And interestingly, proteinuria reduction was seen as early as two months after starting plaquenil. Now, this was a very, very short-term trial. Um, there were no differences in GFR between the two groups, and there was no long-term follow-up to actually correlate that reduction in GFR with the beneficial impact, sorry, that short-term reduction in proteinuria with a beneficial impact on GFR, and which, which, just to remind you, was a requirement from the KHI analysis of using proteinuria as a surrogate was to actually have that long-term follow-up to correlate it with the GFR-based endpoint. So, you know, it's a single center, single ethnicity, very small trial. Um, so we should probably consider this to be quite preliminary, but nonetheless somewhat exciting because Plaquenil is a very low-risk uh, 
uh, very well tolerated therapy. Lupus patients, for example, are on it for years and years. Um, but we need likely a larger multi-center and truly multi-ethnic study to evaluate this further. So what about MMF for the treatment of IG nephropathy? Well, um, MMF probably also works down here like corticosteroids in terms of just ja dampening the general immune response that occurs as a result of immune complex deposition uh, in the kidney. And uh, with a few months ago, there was a trial called the MAIN trial, which was uh, just recently published that looks further at MMF. And so I wanted to talk about that next. And it's, it's again, a single center study from China, 170 patients this time. All the patients had to have reductions in GFR less than 60, but above 30 despite being on maximum RAS blockade and, and, and um, persistent proteinuria. Now it was an open label study. So patients got MMF as an open label dosing for 12 months, a dose reduction for an additional six months. And then after that 18 month period, um, tre treatment was up to, the, up to the physician. So we don't really know uh, what the dosing was really after 18 months, but it was protocolized for the first 18 months of the trial versus continuing supportive care. The outcome here was doubling creatinine, ESKD, or death due to renal disease, or also death due to cardiovascular disease, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. But again, the clinical trial characteristics here were pretty similar. Patients in their mid-30s, uh, proteinuria of around two grams per day. Again, quite a bit of activity on the biopsy, but also more scarring now. We're seeing more segmental sclerosis and more interstitial fibrosis in almost all patients. And this is probably because of the inclusion criteria that required a reduction uh, in GFR. I would also point out, though, that Mesangial hypocellularity was reported in 100% of patients. That's a very unusual finding in an IG cohort uh, and kind of raises questions about maybe some of the pathology uh, reading that was done uh, in the trial. Nonetheless, here's the primary outcome of the trial. So the, again, doubling creatinine, ESKD, or death due to renal cardiovascular disease. Uh, it was significantly lower in the MMF group than it was in the standard therapy group with a hazard ratio of 0.3. However, there were only 24 outcome events, and there was only one death due to cardiovascular disease in the entire trial. So I don't want you to think that MMF reduces cardiovascular disease. It doesn't. The, the entire outcome here was driven by doubling of serum creatinine. And consistent with that, um, there was a reduction in the rate of kidney function decline in the MMF versus the supportive uh, care group. Now, this figure shows the proteinuria trajectory over time. So just to remind you, MMF dosing was protocolized for the first 18 months. After that, we have a hard time knowing what exactly was going on. So proteinuria reduced here, even in the supportive therapy group, right? So what that's probably a manifestation of the fact that this is an open-label study. Patients and their physicians would have known that they were not being given MMF, and so they might have um, consciously made other decisions in terms of targeting supportive therapy in a way that reduced uh, proteinuria. However, the proteinuria did reduce um, uh, to a greater extent in the MMF group, and that seemed to stay uh, reduced out to 18 months. Now, of the original 170 patients in the trial, they, they did a long-term follow-up. So it's a like, post-trial observational follow-up in 157 uh, patients for a median of 60 months. And what they showed is that patients who uh, were in the original supportive care group had pretty stable proteinuria over that time frame. Patients who were originally in the MMF group who at the end of the trial decided to stop MMF, had an increase in proteinuria that started to then resemble the supportive care group, whereas patients who, per, who uh, remained on MMF had a persistent reduction in proteinuria. So, so what this suggests probably is that MMF works while you're on the drug, but if you stop the drug, you may not have a sustained reduction uh, in proteinuria. So the, the summary of this particular trial might be that MMF reduces the risk of kidney function decline and decreases proteinuria, um, that the effects may not persist after MMF is discontinued. And there are certainly certain limitations. It's a single center, single ethnicity trial. Uh, the open label design might have introduced some degree of bias. Again, though, I think we need to consider these results as being preliminary and requiring confirmation in a larger multi-center, multi-ethnic uh, trial. And this is especially true because there is sort of a long sorted history of quite conflicting results of MMF and IG nephropathy. So um, there's been a suggestion that ethnicity may actually modify treatment response to MMF because trials that included mostly white patients from Europe or the United States seem to show no effect, whereas trials from Asia might have showed a slightly larger effect of MMF. However, the, the details of the slide aren't really important, but just to, just to suffice that there are other differences between the trials that might have explained that heterogeneity, including the fact that many of these trials were extremely small. The only other large trial was actually by the same group as did the main trial, and they randomized patients to MMF with reduced dose steroids compared to full dose steroids. 
But in retrospect, that reduced dose steroids they gave with the MMF was not that dissimilar to the reduced dose steroids given in the testing trial, which we know works on its own. So it kind of highlights the fact that we probably really do need larger studies to confirm this benefit before we start sort of using MMF ubiquitously in all patients with IgA nephropathy. So those are some traditional immunosuppressive agents. So now I want to change gears and talk about more novel treatments um, that are being studied for, for IG nephropathy. So first, coming back to the enteric immune system, there's a drug developed called targeted release budesonide, um, which is thought to target um, specifically the B cells uh, in, in the enteric immune system, or at least the, the, the B and T cells in the, in the enteric immune system. So what is targeted release budesonide? It, it's just regular uh, run-of-the-mill budesonide that has been uh, uh, packaged in a proprietary capsule. And this capsule is thought to delay the release of budesonide into the terminal ileum. And it's in the terminal ileum where you have the predominance of payers patches, which contain uh, the immune cells related to the enteric immune system, which are what we think are producing those galactose deficient Ig1 molecules that are so important for the pathogenesis of Ig nephropathy. Budesonide is also thought to have a very high first pass metabolism in the liver, meaning a patient takes budesonide, it works locally, the liver then metabolizes out the budesonide and very limited, a uh, very uh, small amount of it gets exposed systemically, uh, hopefully with reducing, therefore, the number of steroid-related side effects. So uh, this was um, uh, evaluated initially by, uh, in the trial called the Nefigan trial, which was a phase, phase two trial, mostly from Europe, in which patients were randomized to two different doses of targeted release budesonide or placebo. Um, and the primary outcome here was nine, uh, nine month reduction in proteinuria, uh, which was based on that KHI analysis. The authors estimate this would be equivalent to a systemic prednisone exposure of around eight milligrams per day, so not a particularly high dose. Although, quite frankly, they do not provide any real pharmacokinetic data to justify that. So here we have the change in proteinuria over time. So in the two different treatment groups in red and green, you can see proteinuria decline quite substantially. Treatment was given for nine months. And then importantly, proteinuria stayed lower three months after the drug was stopped. So at least in the short term, there seemed to be at least a reduction in proteinuria, whereas uh, proteinuria did not change in the control group as opposed to a change in GFR, which was very stable uh, in the two uh, treatment groups, but seemed to decline uh, in the placebo group. So here we have an early phase study giving us a signal that targeted release budesonide may actually lower proteinuria and stabilize GFR. So based on these results, the larger phase three Nefigar trial was uh, conducted. And what we have now is the publication of the first readout of this trial, which comes from the nine month reduction of proteinuria based on that new clinical trial framework we talked about uh, previously. So this is the design of the Nefigard trial. So it includes patients with IG nephropathy historically and proteinuria above one gram per day on um, uh, optimal RAS blockade who are randomized to nine months of targeted release budesonide, 16 milligrams per day or placebo. Patients were then tapered off the drug. What we're gonna talk about today is the interim readout when 199 patients have sufficient data to look at proteinuria reduction at nine months. Uh, however, there is part B of the study, which is recruiting over 300 patients for at least two years of follow-up to then confirm that benefit on a GFR-based outcome event. So um, there's roughly uh, 200 patients uh, in the trial, maybe now slightly older than testing. We're getting patients into the mid-40s, but with um, a pretty similar uh, GFR, proteinuria over two grams per day. And uh, as opposed to the testing trial, this is now a cohort that is dominated mostly by white patients, which, which uh, as opposed to Asian uh, ethnicity being less common. And again, this is a disease that is distinctly more common uh, in different Asian subgroups. We're also getting a uh, time from biopsy being slightly longer. So now we're pu pushing it out to between two and, and three years. And unfortunately, in this interim publication, there was no data provided whatsoever on different histology characteristics. So we don't know what these patients look like on biopsy. So this figure shows a proteinuria reduction over time. So what you can see is that nine months, there was a significant reduction in proteinuria in the placebo group versus the control group. And if anything, that reduction in proteinuria became even better at 12 months, which was three months after the drug was stopped. Now, this was the primary outcome of the study. And the reason for this was they were looking for expedited drug approval with the FDA based on this outcome. However, the, the um, uh, and, and they did then look at some subgroup analyses. Uh, they didn't really find any difference based on baseline proteinuria or GFR. But again, we don't have any pathology subgroups to really look at this in more detail. 
Now they did report some GFR based outcome events. And so um, in the black line here, we have uh, with the black dots, we have a GFR trajectory in the treatment group versus in the, in the white dots in the placebo group. And uh, we can see the GFR was better uh, uh, at uh, nine months in the treatment group versus placebo. And this persisted uh, out to 12 months. This was not the primary outcome of the study and it wasn't necessarily powered for this, but they did look at GFR trajectory within strata of baseline proteinuria. So patients with higher proteinuria above 1.5 grams per day at baseline had a, you know, an improvement in their GFR in the treatment group. However, patients with lower level of proteinuria, less than 1.5 grams, didn't really seem to have a difference in GFR trajectory over time. So the benefit of the drug on GFR seemed to be predominantly seen in patients with higher level of proteinuria uh, at baseline. So what about adverse events? So um, they reported mostly treatment emergent adverse events, which are um, uh, treat emergent, sorry, serious adverse events, which are slightly different than overall serious adverse events, but nonetheless, uh, that occurred in around 11% of the Neficon group. Now, just to compare, that is actually higher than what was seen in the reduced dose of the testing trial. Now, you can't really just compare serious adverse events like this between trials because there may be other characteristics of the patient patients in these trials that may account for differences in, in serious adverse events. But if you are just interested in the pure toxicity rate, you know, we don't necessarily know that this is a lower toxicity than reduced dose steroids. And indeed, 9% of the cohort actually had to stop drug due to adverse events from the drug. Now, what was different, though, is that there were no infections causing hospitalizations, whereas that was the primary driver of serious adverse events in the testing trial. Now, you can measure glucocorticoid-related adverse events and report them specifically, and they didn't do that in this particular trial. However, in the original Nefigan Phase two trial, they did, and 40% of patients in the Neficon 16 milligram group actually had some degree of glucocorticoid-related adverse events. So I think the sum total of this does raise some concern that maybe the systemic exposure that your body is seeing with prolonged and sustained use of Neficon for, for nine months um, might not actually be as low as we think. Uh, from that theory about first-pass metabolism may not be entirely correct. Nonetheless, based on, um, based on these results uh, and the new framework for clinical trial development, the FDA has now granted accelerated drug approval for targeted release budesonide, which has been rebranded as Tarpeo, um, with the caveat that they have to show ongoing uh, uh, Part B results that confirm a benefit on GFR decline. So this is now the first new novel therapy that has been approved for the treatment of IG nephropathy. Needless to say, no one knows the price of the drug, but it does not, it's probably not very cheap. And it's probably substantially more than regular budesonide. So in, in, in summary, a targeted release budesonide seems to reduce proteinuria at nine months, which is sustained out to 12 months, which is three months after the drug is stopped. Preliminary data suggests a beneficial impact on GFR, especially in those with higher levels of proteinuria. But we need the long-term follow-up to confirm the benefit on GFR, especially in lower levels of proteinuria, to confirm a sustained reduction in proteinuria. And I'd also like to see what's going on in patients with different histologic subgroups. The adverse event profile, I would argue, is concerning for systemic exposure to steroids. We would like to also see some pharmacokinetic data to determine, is it really any different than regular budesonide, which costs a fraction of the price, or for that matter, compared to reduced dose prednisone? However, it does raise the, the, the point, though, that we need less toxic therapies that really have no steroid-related side effects at all. That being said, so Kalidides is the maker of this drug, um, and they recently had a, a press release indicating that their Part B long-term follow-up trial has now met its endpoint, showing a reduction in the rate of kidney function decline over two years. However, this is not published. It's not peer-reviewed. We cannot actually evaluate this, but it does give us some hope that the clinical trial framework developed by the KHI is actually showing some promise in terms of confirming um, the benefit on GFR from those short-term changes in proteinuria. So um, what about uh, a HIT2 here in terms of production of anti-glycan antibodies, or for that matter, the B cells that are likely responsible for producing galactose-deficient IG1 molecules? There's a whole uh, group of medications called BAF or APRIL inhibitors which are, are uh, targeting B cell uh, activation. Um, and uh, Vera Therapeutics makes a drug called uh, uh, Atasacept, which was studied in the ORIGIN trial. To remind you, Atasacept is a combined inhibitor of APRIL or BAF. It's currently approved for other indications and it uh, uh, inhibits B cell um, uh, maturation. 
Um, Atosicept given uh, at 150 milligrams a week, uh, reduced proteinuria at six months significantly compared to placebo. Again, this is an unpublished press release data that gives us some signal now that we're starting to see novel B-cell targeted therapy that might be reducing proteinuria uh, with the hope of potentially impacting GFR long-term in more confirmatory phase three trials. Now, uh, this is not the only drug being studied in this area. So Chinook has a, a currently unnamed drug called Bion 1301, and Vistera has a drug called Cibaprenlimab, both of which are April inhibitors that are now being studied um, in early phase studies, uh, again, looking at novel ways of, of inhibiting B cells um, in IG nephropathy. So uh, what about the complement system? As I mentioned, those immune complexes, when they deposit, they probably activate uh, the immune system through activation of complement. So, so what is complement? Well, complement has three uh, different main um, uh, pathways, including the classic pathway, the lectin pathway, and then the amplifying alternative pathway, all of which turn, um, uh, sort of funnel down into activation of the, the uh, terminal pathway, which forms the membrane attack complex, uh, induces uh, cell lysis and promotes promotes inflammation. Now, the classic pathway is probably not involved that much in IG nephropathy. There is a theory that galactose deficient IG molecules may trigger the lectin pathway, which starts the process and then gets amplified through the alternate pathway. So as a result of this, there are a multitude of different drugs that are being studied um, uh, to inhibit the complement system, none of which really targeting the classic pathway, because as I mentioned, it's probably not involved, but there are multiple different inhibitors um, that are being developed looking at the lectin pathway, in selective inhibitors of the alternative pathway. Uh, uh, alnilam actually makes a very interesting knockdown molecule that inhibits C5. And even some of you may have heard of Avacapan, which is now approved in Canada for the treatment of ankyovasculitis, which is an inhibitor of C5A, which is a side uh, 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 molecule, uh, which is like an anaphylatoxin, induces um, activation and recruitment of, of lots of uh, neutrophils and inflammatory cells that's also being studied uh, in IG nephropathy. All of these are at early phase development in their clinical trial design. So we're starting to now see either preliminary studies or press releases suggesting that these drugs are reducing proteinuria in IG nephropathy. And again, according to our new clinical trial framework, gives us some hope that at least some of these may, may prove to be effective in terms of reducing kidney function decline uh, over time. So if we go back to our, to our guidelines, as I mentioned, the first step in treatment is really focusing on optimal supportive care. So blood pressure management, RAS blockade, salt restriction, things like that. So what about new treatments that might, instead of focusing on the immune system, focus up here in terms of supportive therapy? Well, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the subgroup analysis of the DAPA CKD trial. So the, the DAPA trial was a, it wasn't, it wasn't an IgA trial at all. It was a CKD trial. Uh, looking at patients with decreased GFR between 25 and 75, persistent proteinuria, with or without diabetes, and they randomized patients to dapagliflozin or placebo with a primary kidney outcome of a 50% decline in GFR or ESKD. Now, importantly, they specifically excluded any patients with recent immunosuppression exposure. So they're really looking at patients with kind of chronic kidney disease. And in it just so happens that in 270 patients within the DAPA trial, happened to have CKD due to IG nephropathy, of whom 254 had this confirmed on a biopsy. So, so what I'm going to show you right now are the subgroup analysis of the DAPA trial done in these 270 participants who had IG nephropathy. And this is the risk of a 50% decline in GFR or ESKD, and it was very substantially reduced by DAPA flows and with a hazard ratio of 0.24, which on one hand is very uh, exciting and shows a huge treatment effect, on the other hand, if you look at the rate of outcome in the placebo group at two years, so these, this x-axis is in months, so at two years, that risk was 16%, which is extremely high for a cohort with IG nephropathy. We don't usually see that risk over such a short time frame. It raises the question of what kind of patients were actually included in this trial. So if you compare the DAPA cohort to the testing cohort we talked about previously, the age, the, these were patients were 10, 15 years older than in the, in the testing trial. Baseline proteinuria was lower. That's very interesting because proteinuria is probably one of the most important predictors of outcome, and it was substantially lower than in the testing trial. And as you would expect from a CKD trial, the GFR was, was quite a bit lower. Now, they didn't provide any information about histology lesions, but the rate of kidney function decline in the placebo group in the DAPA uh, study was 4.6 compared to roughly 5, so pretty similar to what was seen in testing. 
So this raises an important question, like what kind of patients would be included in this DAPA trial such that they would have such a huge risk of kidney function decline, such a rapid rate of kidney function decline, despite having much, much lower levels of proteinuria. And so we did sort of a hypothetical analysis where we hypothesized different histology lesions that may have been present in the DAPA CKD group and then applied our prediction tool and predicted the two-year risks of outcome. And what we showed is that you really didn't you did not achieve a two-year risk of around 16% until patients started to have quite a high amount of scarring with an S1 or T2 lesion, meaning patients had more than 50% interstitial fibrosis in the presence of glomerulosclerosis. So what this most likely means is that the DAPA CKD group is, is, is probably a cohort of patients with chronic CKD due to Ig nephropathy that were older, uh, lower levels of kidney function, higher burden of scarring on a biopsy, and I think this is exactly what you would expect out of a CKD trial that specifically excluded recent immunosuppression. It was just including patients who are at a more advanced stage of their disease who had CKD due to Ig nephropathy. But I think what it does mean is that there's currently no evidence for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in conjunction with immunosuppression or instead of immunosuppression. And I think that's important. If you look at the serious adverse event rate, there was 16% serious adverse event rate in the DAPA glifosin trial. Now, again, to compare that, there was a 5% serious adverse event rate in the reduced dose of the testing trial. So again, these are probably different trial cohorts. But again, if your focus is predominantly on toxicity, it's not necessarily lower uh, in this particular trial cohort. Now, part of that may be because the trial cohort may have had more comorbidities than what was seen in the patients in the testing trial. And if you look at the presence of diabetes as a marker for that, certainly there was substantially more diabetes in this subgroup than there was in testing. However, on the flip side, what's the duration of treatment with dapagliflozin? It's actually lifelong, right? Like when you start it, you're giving it to someone in their mid-30s and you're going to continue it for decades and decades and decades, as opposed to reduced dose steroids, you're giving it for a much shorter period of time. So prednisone is clearly more toxic per unit time than dapagliflozin, but you're giving it for a much, much shorter period of time, as opposed to indefinite lifelong therapy with dapa. Now, since that publication, uh, the EMPA kidney trial has also come out. It, it also had quite a few patients with Ig nephropathy. Now, they haven't published that subgroup analysis separately, but this is data pulled out of a meta-analysis that combined the DAPA and EMPA uh, groups with Ig nephropathy and showed, again, a consistent reduction in the risk of kidney function decline with EMPA gifloz. And so it seems quite reasonable that SGLT2 inhibitors are very effective at reducing the rate of kidney function decline in patients with CKD due to Ig nephropathy. However, I would point out that when they looked at patients with any kind of glomerular disease, they also saw the same signal. So it probably doesn't matter what kind of GN you have. The moment you have uh, CKD and chronic disease as a result of that GN, using an SGLT2 inhibitor will likely reduce your risk of kidney function decline. Yeah. So in summary, in those with advanced CKD to Ig nephropathy, SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the risk of kidney outcomes. But there's really no, currently no evidence to generalize these results to patients at an earlier stage of their disease who might actually have more activity. And I would point out that these, these are not disease-modifying therapies, and they're likely effective in any kind of patient with any type of GN and advanced CKD. So my personal opinion is that we should not replace therapeutic options that directly target the immunopathogenesis of IG nephropathy. We should probably look to somehow combine these together. And certainly as more trials are done in the era of SGLT2 inhibitors, we'll have more data that address certain areas of uncertainty right now, such as what's the safety of combining an SGLT2 inhibitor in a patient with immunosuppression? What's the efficacy of an immunosuppressive agent compared to an SGLT2 inhibitor? And specifically, do we actually need to even modify the proteinuria thresholds we use to even allocate immunosuppression if that patient happens to already be on an SGLT2 inhibitor? We really don't know the answers to these. And as more data comes out, hopefully we'll be able to tease these issues out. So what about endothelin-1? So, so endothelin-1 um, uh, is thought to result in vasoconstriction within the kidney to reduce, and that produces glomerular hypertension, glomerular sclerosis. It might have some direct impacts on podocytes contributing to glomerular sclerosis, as well as direct impacts uh, causing interstitial fibrosis. And the thought is that uh, another way of augmenting supportive therapy is you can combine RAS blockade with endothelin receptor antagonists to really augment supportive care. Now, this concept is not unique to Ig nephropathy. It's been, it's been studied in other diseases. Sparsentin is a dual inhibitor of endothelin um, uh, and uh, angiotensin receptor blocker. It's been studied in a group of patients with predominantly secondary FSGS. And atracentin um, is an endothelin receptor antagonist that was studied in the SONAR trial in patients with 
diabetic nephropathy, both of which showed beneficial impacts either in proteinuria or kidney function decline over the long term. So um, actually, I need to update the slide. Uh, the PROTECT trial uh, looks at sparsantan and IG nephropathy. It's made by a company called Treveri Therapeutics. Um, a, a few months ago, they published a press release suggesting that in the PROTECT trial, there was a reduction in proteinuria at nine months um, in, in the sparsantan group versus a active comparator of herbisartan. And again, based on this interim nine-month results, the FDA in the United States has now granted accelerated drug approval for sparsantan treatment in IG nephropathy. Now, initially, this wasn't published, but actually the trial was published a few days ago in the Lancet trial, uh, in, um, in, in Lancet. And, and, you know, interestingly, again, we're seeing this, this being a cohort of, of really chronic, uh, chronic patients with IG nephropathy, on average, about six years now after their biopsy. So again, this is probably a supportive therapy that might be appropriate in patients who are at a more chronic stage uh, of, their, of their disease. But this is another example of using that clinical trial framework to then have now the second drug approval for IG nephropathy in the last few years based on proteinuria reduction. But just to show you that sparsantan is not the only drug being developed in this space, atrocentan, uh, which was investigated in the SONAR trial, is now being also investigated in IG nephropathy. And there was a, a, a very small study of 20 patients that suggested a reduction in proteinuria. And this is being investigated further in a phase three trial. So I think the future landscape for the treatment of IG nephropathy is, you know, extremely positive, right? Historically, we've had very few high quality studies looking mostly at different kind of protocols on, on corticosteroids. And now since the KHI analysis and our new framework, we now have an explosion of clinical trials that are using that short-term reduction in proteinuria as a surrogate marker for outcome. And if even a small proportion of these successfully move through phase three trials and show a reduction in GFR, I think in the next few years, we're going to have a new, much more enviable problem of too many therapies to choose from. And we have to decide which drug do we use in which patient, uh, which time course in their, in their disease which I think is at least a far more um, a, a, a positive situation to be in than our old situation where we had really no therapies we wanted to use at all. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the next five years, we will have more and more drugs coming to market. And of course, from a Canadian perspective, we hope that, that those drugs then come into, come into Canada as well. So with that, I'll, I'll end the talk. And um, I'd like to thank my sources of, of research funding and salary support, which I've which I've listed here, um, and I'll take any uh, questions. Sorry, Sean, can I ask you a question? Call it Bashir, no. please, George. You know, uh, can you just uh, mention about some mass Z score? And, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, like how do you use this uh, to, to guide your therapy with the, you know, steroids and all that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the MESS C score, as I mentioned, was a standardized histology score that, that has a mixture of active and chronic lesions within it. It was primarily designed for us to figure out which patients are going to have progressive decline in kidney function over time. It was not necessarily designed for us to pick out which patients might respond or not to immunosuppression. Um, so those are very, very different questions. Um, there is not a lot of data on which patients might respond. There are some repeat biopsy studies that have suggested that um, uh, endocapillary hypocellularity, crescents, fibrinoid necrosis might be lesions that respond to steroids, maybe mesangial hypocellularity. Um, I, I can't tell you which combination of those lesions might be more or less likely to respond, but what I can say, if someone doesn't has a good biopsy and they don't really have any active disease, then I tend not to treat them with, with immunosuppression because um, you, know, you haven't really demonstrated any form of active inflammatory process that, that may, may require immunosuppression. That may be the kind of patient that's ideally suited for an SGLT2 inhibitor or down the road, um, an endothelin receptor antagonist or other forms of supportive, supportive care. Uh, it's not that the patient didn't have active IG nephropathy at some point, but it might've been you know, way earlier in their course and you're sort of biopsying them uh, later. Hopefully we'll get you know, more data on that in terms of how we, how we do a more refined decision about which patients should or shouldn't be treated with individual therapies. Thanks. Sean? Sean? Um, yeah. It's uh, two questions. One is, uh, has anybody looked at that, the first component of your four-hit hypothesis, looking at the uh, 
at the molecule, the of IgA and the gut, and 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 altering that. That's that's the first question. And the second question is, many of the conclusions you're coming to are are not through the primary outcomes, but from data that's. You had one study that uh, that you quoted that it was a meta analysis and then a subgroup analysis of the meta analysis, and it seems to me that that's that's got a lot of danger to it. So could you comment on both of those? Yeah. So one of the big challenges about measuring the lactose deficient IgA is that it's been quite it's quite hard to measure. the The assay used to um, to 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 measure it used to be based on it's called the helix asperva assay, which basically is a fancy way of saying you take snail shells and grind them up and use it as a substrate to bind galactose deficient molecules. So needless to say, there was a lot of heterogeneity in that particular assay. So levels seem to be all over the place. There was a lot of overlap between patients with disease versus controls or, or, or between different cohorts. More recently, a group out of Japan um, developed something called the KM55 ELISA assay, which is a more standardized ELISA assay for measuring galactose deficient Ig1 molecules. So, you know, hopefully as we start to get more data on that, we might be able to correlate the levels of galactose deficient IgA1 molecules with uh, disease activity and response to treatment. So right now we don't necessarily have a lot of that. Um, I didn't present this, but there was a study looking at rituximab, which you think might then impact B cell production of galactose deficient IgA as well as anti-glycan antibodies. But interestingly, it didn't seem to impact levels of either of those things or or proteinuria or kidney function. So it was a basically a wholesale failure, um, which you know might be partially due to some in some ways assay measurement, in other ways, uh, the type of patients that got into that trial. Uh, but there does seem to be um, evidence that other B cell therapies that target production of galactose deficient IgA, like April and BAF inhibitors, do seem to have, at least at this point, some signal of benefit. It'll be interesting to see if we start measuring those galactose deficient levels. Do they actually come down in parallel? with um, with uh, proteinuria. Certainly IgA levels, overall IgA levels do decline quite quite rapidly, but that's true in, you know, in all patients. Like if you gave me or you or anybody those drugs, IgG and IgA levels would come down. So, so hopefully we'll get more data on that. In terms of the subgroup analyses, I essentially entirely agree with you. And the reason why I'm mentioning these studies is that you know, once SGLT2 data came out, like I would say, I would say the, the presentation of the DAPA CKD subgroup analysis was very controversial. Um, it, it was presented as if it was one of the biggest, most important trials in IG nephropathy, when in fact it wasn't. It was a subgroup of another trial done for a different reason in patients with CKD. But as a result of that, there's been a big push by drug companies to push SGLT2 inhibitors in IgA. And so, you know, I just don't want nephrologists to think that, hey, I got someone with a lot of active disease uh, I can just treat them with an SGLT2 inhibitor and I'm done because you're not you're not really impacting the underlying disease uh, uh, process. And so um, as opposed to the endothelial and receptor antagonist trials, which are being done specifically in cohorts with IG nephropathy, but we need them to report histology lesions and basic characteristics of at what point of the disease process are these patients being recruited into the trial? Because if again, if they're very chronic patients, they're very different than a patient that's diagnosed very close to a biopsy with a lot of active disease. So we need to understand this more. Um, of course, it's up, the drug companies really like the idea of, of pushing these drugs that should be used in all patients, started early and continued indefinitely. That's, that's quite good for their financial bottom line, but I think we need to kind of sort out more what groups of patients might actually benefit. Okay. I think uh, we're going to have to end. It's uh, just after lunch. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Thank you very much.